Dr. Robert Martin is now the Dean and Professor of Christian Formation and Leadership at Wesley Theological Seminary. He has served on the faculties of St. Paul School of Theology in Kansas City and the Yale Divinity School. He earned his PhD in Practical Theology with a concentration in Christian education from Princeton Theological Seminary, writing his dissertation on theological epistemology. Dr. Martin published the book, The Incarnate Ground of Christian Faith, that develops a theological epistemology for the educational ministry of the church. He is currently working on a monograph that characterizes the church and leadership within Trinitarian and incarnational theology as fundamentally baptismal and Eucharistic. Over his career, he has been concerned with theological nature of teaching and learning. Examples of this literature include From Objectifying to Contemplating the Other, an incarnational approach to pedagogy and theological education, and Insisto Recto, provocative play for serious leadership learning. Robert is on the editorial board of the Journal of Religious Leadership and is an elder in the Missouri Conference of the United Methodist Church. My experience of Robert in these few weeks, few months now as dean, is that he is a man who's listening carefully. Uh, to know the history and the story of this institution uh, so that he can find his place in leadership here. And I am so pleased and eager uh, to welcome him here as dean and to hear what he has to say to us today. Will you join me in welcoming him? Thanks. It is a really great pleasure to be here with you and to speak to you for a while. I got to tell you, I am still intimidated by the audience. So we'll, um, we'll have to see how this lecture goes. What we're going to try to do as much as, I, uh, as is possible, because I tend to go on a little bit too long, is we're going to close down the presentation part around 210, 215, something like that, and then we're going to engage in a conversation, okay? So uh, let's, let's jump into it. So let me tell you kind of what I would like to do, kind of give you the overview of what I'd like to talk about, and then we'll get into it a little bit. In this kind of a lecture, what a lot of people do, they want to go real narrow and focused so that they can say what they're going to say with great clarity and depth. And, but that's not what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to give you an overview or a kind of a, a vision of thinking about theological education that is oriented theologically. There's a, obviously from what I've done, the book and some articles and stuff like that, I've been thinking about this for quite a while and there's, there's quite a bit of literature at the base of all this. But uh, I thought for this kind of a lecture that I would give a pretty broad, overarching view. And the second thing I want to emphasize is that this is not just for theological education, because I think that ministry, that theological education and Christian ministry are, really should be the same thing. They should have the same core, should revolve around and emerge from the same core, right? And so that core for me is explicated in the doctrines of the Trinity and Incarnation. Um, a lot of times we think about those doctrines as very abstract and really not having to do so much with the nitty-gritty of day-to-day -day life. But I hope to show you in this presentation that quite the reverse is true. They are probably the most practical doctrines in the church, of the church. And as you might well know, the most practical thing in the world, right? The most practical thing there is, is a great idea, right? So the more we have a great idea, a beautiful, elegant idea, and uh, an idea that strives for truth, right? Truth and the big T. The more our action can be oriented by that 
and can become much more effective. You know, you know this in your life that all of your action is oriented by ideas, by what you think, right? The way you brush your teeth, the way you eat at a table, uh, the reason why you go to a store. It's all oriented by your idea for this or that activity. And so if you change an idea, if you orient yourself by an idea, then all the practice following that idea, if it's oriented to it, is changed by it, right? So the having of good ideas, as Eleanor Duckworth says, is a wonderful and wondrous thing. So that's what we're going to do. So I'm thinking that pastoral ministry, uh, when I was teaching pastoral ministry, I tried to orient everything to Trinity and Incarnation. And the, the, just like I talked about in the sermon today, you can, you can identify and correlate the doctrine of the Trinity with the ritual of the Eucharist. It's very similar. And so the Eucharist is essentially a working out, a practical liturgical working out of the doctrine of the Trinity and also the Incarnation. But I also want to suggest to you, and we'll get into this in the, in the lecture a bit, that the doctrine of the Incarnation is likewise not just about Jesus as the Incarnation of God, but it is about our life as well. That the Incarnation, the doctrine of Incarnation has everything to do with who we are and how we are related to God. Everything. And so if we can orient theological education, but also ministry and the Christian life, then uh, to these two doctrines, it will ground us not only in what I would say would be true, you know, true with a small t, but it is very, it, it, it is an evocative, it is a very powerful um, framework an ideational framework from which all of what we can and should do should be organized, okay? So that's the big picture. So let's get going. You know as well as I do that the church and society is in a period of great transition, and the forms that we are very much used to are waning in their meaning especially for the younger generations, and especially for people who are on the margins. Now, it's very interesting that we have come to identify being church with a particular historical form called the congregation. And, but if you look in the United Methodist polity, if you look in Presbyterian polity, if you look in uh, uh, Roman Catholic Orthodox polity, it's not the congregation that is the default referent of the word church. You know, if I asked you, did you go to church two days ago? You're going you're gonna to be wondering, did you go to a congregational church? service of worship or teaching or something like that. And so you say, yeah, I did or I didn't. Why do, we, why do we do that? Why is the default convention for understanding church, for being a referent for church, the word church that Paul calls the body of Christ, the embodiment of Christ, the enactment of the divine life, why do we by default associate that reality with a particular historical form? That's kind of interesting. So that when that particular form goes out of vogue, we think that the church is waning as well. Well, actually, the waning of uh, uh, mainline especially, but conventional default forms of being a congregation, that waning, that decline, may very well open up a time in which the church, more broadly conceived, more fundamentally theologically conceived, can reimagine itself 
theologically. So Phyllis Tickle actually says that the church goes through a huge rummage sale every 500 years. I don't know if she's right, but it's at least a very suggestive uh, thing to think about. Because before today, before this period of great transformation in church and society, 500 years ago was the Great Reformation, right? And 500 years before that was the Great Schism. And 500 years before that was the monastic movement, right? The dissolution of the empire and the rise of the monastic movement. And then before that was Jesus, hello. <laughs> and the transformation of Judaism, right? Uh, and so there is this pattern. And so we are very lucky to be in a period of time that um, potentially helps us to reorganize what we're thinking. Now, the question is, what are we going to organize our thinking and practice of being church, right? Not just a congregation or a building as a referent, but being the existence of embodying Christ, right? Im imaging forth the divine life. What if we were, what are we going to organize that around, are we going to organize ourselves around the latest fad, the latest trend, in order to market ourselves more, uh, you know, fully? Are we going to, is that going to be our primary drive, right? So we have to, we have to stay empire-ish. We have to stay imperial in our, in our drive. So we're going to try to reach as many people as possible. And so that's the fundamental organizing principle for being church is just converting as many people as possible? I would say that the doctrines of Trinity and Incarnation should be, really, the organizing principle. So I'm going to focus on Incarnation at this point, uh, because to do both would require me to keep you in this room for about two days. So we don't want to do that. So let's talk about there you go. Let's talk about theology as what David Kelsey says is an orientation to, now not just thinking, right? Not just thinking, but theology, a logos about theos. And what is logos? Right? What's that word mean? It means word, but what does it also mean? maybe even more fundamentally means structure, order, rationality. So the fundamental structure, a logos of something is the fundamental order and structure and rationality that is explicated as word. Word explicates this invisible reality. See? So what we're going to do is organize ourselves around theology as a way of being oriented to God and all things in relation to God. Okay. So to understand the incarnation, we need to, of course, start with the incarnation of Jesus Christ, the incarnation of God as Jesus Christ. But we don't want to stop there. And that's where most people stop with their understanding of the incarnation. But a long time ago, 6th century, St. Maximus the Confessor was a principal uh, and eloquent explainer of incarnation and the incarnation of the incarnational quality of creation as a means of God's grace and of the divine presence. Now, what we mean by the divine presence, and especially for St. Maximus Confessor, is exactly what we did in the Eucharist um, before lunch. So, the, the divine presence is a reality, is a relational reality that is communal, right? So, it's not just about us feeling God or just thinking about God. It is about us and our lives being organized according to the fundamental structure, 
order and rationality of the divine life, which is always communal. In the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John, I think, and many others think, is a gospel of incarnation. And you, the very, cha- the very first chapter is the, the organizes and orients the entire book to all things, everywhere, all the time, being incarnated in and through, all th- that all things are created in and through the divine logos, the divine order, structure, and rationality. So that our lives should be as uh, created in this logos and held in this logos and returning, right, to God, right? You remember Colossians' first chapter and Ephesians' first chapter, all things created in and through him and all things returning back to the Father through the Son, right? right? So we're continually created and redeemed in and through this divine logos, So Thomas F. Torrance, Reformed theologian, said that this unity, this ongoing creative unity of creation and creator is the very linchpin of Christian theology. Without it, everything, with it, everything hangs together. Without it, everything ultimately falls apart. Now, that's a pretty strong claim to make about one doctrine. But that just gives you some idea of the fundamental nature of this doctrine. That it can be a fulcrum, a vortex, out of which our life is organized. So, God is revealed and the divine life of Trinitarian communion right? I'm speaking as a Trinitarian theologian, right? So a Unitarian uh, perspective would be very different. A, um, a Judaic framework would be rather different, and, right? So there are these differences that are very important to take uh, into consideration. But what we want to have in mind fundamentally is that God is ongoingly creating us and that we are being created in and through the Logos, and that this relationship of ongoing creation is incarnational in nature, in fact. And so this may help, uh, it may help us to get a little bit clearer understanding about this if we just think about how our lives are incarnational. Our existence is incarnational. For the most fundamental aspects of being human is meaning. And you can't see, touch, or smell meaning. It's invisible. But yet, every second of your life is a manifestation of meaning, of one kind of meaning or another. Every thought you've ever had has been invisible. And yet your entire life is organized by it. Your emotions, you can't see, touch, or smell an emotion. But you can certainly see the manifestation of it. Our existence is incarnational, fundamentally and without exception. And that is a reflection. Our existence as incarnational is a reflection of the God who continues to create us in and through the Logos. You see? So the very uh, relationship of our creation that constitutes our creation is incarnational and it would be uh, just, of course, it would be a matter of course to say that then our lives are uh, framed by that and constituted by that very activity, that our existence reflects that fundamental incarnational relationship of creator and creation. That's just crucial, I think, to get in mind, get firmly in mind. Sally McFaig says that uh, she takes the incarnation approach a little bit further to say that the universe, the whole universe, is not only a work of God, right? God is not just working on the creation from the outside, 
but rather the creation, the very universe itself, is the embodiment of God. Not the whole embodiment. It's not embodying the whole of God, but it is an ongoing incarnation of God. And so that's why the fundamental purpose of the universe is to be a means of grace. In this view, God is the source of all, sustainer of all, the destiny of all, and the universe is the physical manifestation of divine, extravagant ecstasis. Ecstasis. God is ecstatic in God's love. The one, she says, God is the one upon whom everything is dependent for everything. Each creature's first and last breath, the billions of species living, of living things, and billions of electrons and quarks and all that constitute, and co that constitute all things, the stars and galaxies, and so on. God, the unnameable one, the ineffable one, is the source of all power, all love, all good, in and with and for everything at all times and places. This is the ubiquitous God par excellence. This God is never absent, for God is being itself, the source of all being, without whom nothing else is. Thomas Merton writes in a similar vein, life is this simple. We are living in a world that is absolutely transparent and God is shining through it all the time. This is not just a fable or a nice story, it's true. If we abandon ourselves to God and forget ourselves, we see it sometimes. And we see it maybe frequently. God manifests God's self everywhere and everything and people and things and nature and in events. It becomes very obvious that he's everywhere and in everything and we cannot be without him. You cannot be without God, says Thomas Merton. It's impossible, simply impossible. So there we go. We have a theological definition of incarnation and we have a rather existential definition of incarnation as well as the very nature of ourselves. So within this theological perspective and taking theolo theology seriously, we'll try to think about theological education. Once again, as David Kelsey says, in light of God and all things in relation to God. So when we talk about incarnation, we have to distinguish between our thinking about incarnation uh, and the incarnation of God as Jesus Christ and our incarnational existence. Now stay with me here. So when we say that God is incarnate in Jesus Christ, it's kind of a one-way movement. If you think of God as the ground of being, you don't have to, but you can if you want to, kind of how I do. So Paul Tillich's ground of being, and that's kind of down yonder, right? And then I think of incarnation as an emergence, uh, a manifestation, right, in the embodiment of things. That's just how I think about it. I don't think about God as up above. I think of God as within and beyond and emerging. It's just, it's just the way I've come to think about it. Now, if we are limited and sinful then we are alienated from the ground of our being to some extent. So the first movement of incarnation is to overcome or go through that alienation, you see? So sin is actually a very important doctrine of, the, of Christian theology. It doesn't mean that you're a horrible person or wretched or, you know, you know, whatever. But it does mean that we're inherently limited and fallible and sinful. And so overcoming the alienation by indwelling the reality, the divine life, is how I think of the first movement of incarnation. That we have to so orient ourselves and allow ourselves to be drawn into God 
drawn into the divine life such that it can form us and mold us and we are conformed to it. Now, so that's the second movement. First movement is to overcome the alienation by what Michael Polanyi would say is an indwelling, a way of knowing that is indwelling the particulars of an object, of a reality. And then as we know the particulars, as we become part of that, as we let ourselves be immersed more fully in that reality, we become conformed to that reality, and that reality can manifest itself in and through us. Let's just take an example. I taught my daughter how to ride a bicycle. All right? So it's very simple. You ride a bicycle. Well, she doesn't know how to ride a bicycle at, you know, four or five years old. And so as soon as she gets on it, she's going to go boom, right? Well, so what, what, what do we do is little by little, we get behind her and she's straddling the bicycle and we just run with her and so she can get her sense of balance, right? So she is feeling herself. She is getting a sense of the bicycle and her own balance on it. And at the point in which she has a sense of her own balance, what is she doing? She is indwelling the particulars of the bicycle and her body on the bicycle and gravity and physics and all that stuff. She is gradually indwelling that and she is taking that unity of herself, the bicycle, and physics. And she is going to gradually start pedaling and then the unity of her own indwelling will be manifest in her riding the bicycle. Does this make sense? So the unity, see, what, what was once divided is now unified to some extent, and then that is manifest as a deepening and greater capacity, what? To bicycle. So learning how to bicycle helps you bicycle even more. You see? So it is an ongoing cycle of intensification. Now, let me just, I told you before, incarnation is related to baptism. So let's get a little bit theological and ritualized here. What else is baptism... I did this to the uh, incoming students, right? What else is baptism? If you've got immersion baptism, what else is it? Then a letting go of everything that separates you from God and an increasing immersion into God, the water, by means of someone holding you, you got to let go, so that what you can be unified to some extent that is then the means by which you are raised up to new life, a new life that is the expression of the unity that you have experienced. You see? And so what happens is that the rest of, we think that baptism is just, okay, we're done, all done. Got baptized, all done. No. The Christian life is an increasing immersion in the divine life. So you are going deeper and you're letting go of more of that to which you grasp for your salvation, right? We're, we're, it's like we're grasping onto the sides of the bathtub and not going under, right? But baptism, you got to let go. you got to let go of that to which you grasp for your salvation so that you can be immersed more fully in that which is truly salvific. So you can then be raised up to new life. So it's the baptismal imperative to the entire Christian life, this cycle. And so this is what is mirrored in an epistemology of increasing indwelling. That is, indwelling a reality ever more fully, no matter what it is. Language, uh, a French, right? You have French, right? I don't, yeah, I know French un peu, right? Right? So, but what? At some point, I didn't know French at all. I was completely alienated from the language, right? 
So gradually, by learning the particulars, the words, the grammar, this is really important. You don't learn a language by, uh, by relativizing the language, do you? You can't say, well, I don't like that grammar. I'm going to use my own grammar, and I'm going to call that French. Or, I don't like those French words. I think I'll just make up my own words, right? And then I'll call it French. No. To learn French, you have to, you know, those little cards, you have to do the, the, the cards, and you have to walk around and think and think, and then all of a sudden, you start dreaming French. You are immersing yourself in a reality that is not you, but to which you are being conformed so that you dream in French, right? Without your, without your intention, you are being, you know, you're being in, you, in, you have indwelled the language and it is becoming you. It is emerging in and through you. So that's the, that's the key here. So I want to say that these two movements of incarnation are all about indwelling and then allowing that unity to emerge in and through you. And that is what theological education, that's what Christian ministry, that's what the Christian life is all about, but particularly theological education. Okay? So it's baptismal. Indwelling, letting go, experiencing a unity at the, at the apex, and then allowing that divine life to change you. So there are some pedagogical imperatives that I want to set before you. One is that in order for you to learn French, there has to be a very clear understanding of what French is. Right? In order for us to learn how to do a bicycle, ride a bicycle, there has to be a bicycle there, a real thing, something that has distinction. But what we've done is that a lot of times in order to accommodate everybody, our theological vision of who God is is not clear. It's fuzzy. It's not distinct. It's vague. And that hampers our ability to know God more fully. It doesn't mean that our knowledge is the be-all, end-all. It doesn't mean it's completely true or accurate. Of course, it's not because we're always limited and fallible. Always, without exception. But what we have to have is an ongoing vision and a means of participation. And that's exactly what these rituals are supposed to be. They're supposed to be absolutely clear and distinct patterns by which we dwell more fully in the reality. Not so we can be closed down, but so we can be opened up to the universal activity and presence of God everywhere in all things. And called by all different names. And celebrated in all different kinds of religions. So that's the first point. A clear and distinct theological vision and participation that is not saddled or diluted by vague, fuzzy thinking. Secondly, is to illumine the blind spot, to, elim to illuminate our limitation and the distance. We need that, right? We need points of confession, right? So, I mean, you're, you're hearing all the, the typical Christian liturgy here. But we need to confess. And so that helps us identify the distance between ourselves and God or any other thing. Uh, that's what grades are all about. That's what professors' comments on papers are all about. And so the clearer that we as professors can be on the limitations of this work, the more fully the student can then reorient themselves to, be, to let themselves be immersed more deeply in this fundamental um, and all-inclusive reality. You see the point here, right? So the point is that we really need to um, uh, reignite and be more intentional 
to be clear and distinct, as Charles Peirce would say. Clear and distinct ideas are crucial in our business. The second is then to have patterns by which we both mentally and physically indwell and orient our mind and our bodies to sacrifice our bodies, right, to this um, so that we, are, we allow ourselves to be conformed more fully. And indwelling, uh, we'll see in just a minute, has both very precise critical thinking Critical thinking is crucial to indwelling, but also contemplation. Also contemplation, but that will come to. And then the last one I want to say is this process of by, by the unification that we experience, we take whatever unity we have experienced and that we know and that we allow our lives to express that. And so what we do on this campus, the way that we organize our meal taking, the way we organize our dorms, the way we organize our classrooms, are all means of this expression, and they are also means by, of this indwelling as well. How are we organizing our lives such that we're able to do these four things? I have no idea what time it is. 2.15. So let me, let me tell you, let me point out one, tell you what, that's it. That's great. Well, I don't mean that this is great. I just mean, <laughs> I think we're at a point where we can stop and have a conversation about this. But I hope, so just to wrap it up, I hope that you get a sense for the way that doctrine if we take it seriously, if we engage it praxeologically, right, with our bodies and in communion, if we orient ourselves to it, that it can tell us how to orient our lives in education and in ministry. It gives us some provocative um, uh, principles by which to orient ourselves. All right, so with that, I'll open it up and let's have a conversation and we'll end by 2.30 at the very least. Yes. Very loud. There you go. Thank you. Yeah, so we are, so there is a doctrine that's very closely related to, and others in this room will be much better able to talk in greater depth about this, but there's a doctrine called panentheism, panentheism. It's not pantheism, panentheism. And it's about, it's a doctrine that is very closely related to incarnation. And it says that we that God is in all things and all things are on God without exhausting God, w without any limitation. So it is, it is the, the doctrine of the infinite eminence of God in all things and the infinite transcendence of God beyond all things. And so the way that we indwell the Spirit of Christ, that's the Romans passage, right? We indwell, and there's a mutual indwelling implied in Romans, right? So that, uh, so John talks all about, the Gospel of John talks all about abiding in Christ. And uh, that kind of, uh, we are grafted into Christ. And that we are taking Christ in as bread, Right? All those images that are very much about ingesting and being grafted in. And so all those images are 
having to do with this kind of mutual indwelling. The, the indwelling is very different because the Spirit is infinite and eternal and we are limited, right, and just incredibly finite. So the, the form of indwelling, the nature of indwelling, very, very different. But the mode is uh, quite similar, I think, right? So in terms of biblical reference, there is a great uh, treasure trove of, of references to our life in God and God's life in and through us. Yeah, great question, great question. Yes, in the back. Well, actually, it's, it's a vision that is exactly what President McAllister Wilson talked about when he introduced not just me, but, but Wesley's, the genius of Wesley, and the reason, honestly, why it, it was very attractive to me, and I've been looking at Wesley for a very long time and uh, with admiration and great respect, because the, the, the seminary as a whole strives and accomplishes to some extent, to a great extent, this integration of knowledge and vital piety. As long as we don't understand it individualistically. Right? Okay? So, uh, so honestly, I, I, I honestly don't have to answer, I don't feel compelled to answer very much, except to say exactly what he said. It is, it is about organizing and orienting every single detail in this community, theologically and spiritually. In order to do so, we have to be very clear about what it is that we are orienting and organizing ourselves to, you see. So the clearer we can become, the more exacting our action can be, and then the more fully we can um, indwell the, the divine life. So th I want to give you three, a, a cycle. Greater awareness, both body and mind, allows us to be more intentional, to participate more fully, which allows greater awareness, which allows greater intention to participate more fully. You see? Right? So it's this, it's this baptismal move of going deeper and deeper all the time in every aspect. Now, I got to tell you, so thinking about every single detail of this would, is going to make everybody crazy if we start to do that, right? right? We'll, get, we'll, we'll really go crazy. So it is about identifying those things that are most important now and working our way very slowly, methodically, and gradually t toward, you know, perfecting uh, our life together. And, uh, and that is never going to end, but it's the process that is so exciting and wonderful, right? So, and it's all about enjoying, right? Uh, enjoying the journey. Not to, it's, it's not a task. It is a life that we're building together. And this sets a context. If, as we do that here, as you do that in your dorm, 
or as you do that in your house, right, or if you do that in your classroom, it sets the stage to form our lives both somatically and mentally, both in explicitly and implicitly, tacitly, so that we are formed in the manner of the divine life. Right? Okay? So, yes. Yeah, that's great. That is great. So the question, it's not a question, it was a comment, more or less, is that there's something missing here. And he's absolutely right, and that is chaos. Because you, if we're indwelling something we don't know, then it's going to go beyond the order that we are accustomed to it's going to help us discern a deeper order, right? And so that is going to disturb the existing order. That is what civil rights does. That's what every movement of transformation in society does. That movement, the civil rights movement, is discerning and um, prophetically calling society to a deeper reality, that transcends the current divisions, right, and oppressions. And so it is calling us to this deeper order that is going to subvert and destroy, in many respects, the, the previous order, right? It, or at least realign it to this more full. That's what happens at conversion, when, you, when people are converted and they have a wowie zowie experience and their whole life is changed, what do you think has happened? But that their life has kachunk, fallen into this um, deeper room, deeper level that then reframes the entire thing. That's what transformation is. It's a categorical, axiomatic change of the, of the, well, I said axioms, of the axioms of a system, right? It's transformation, it's axiomatic change, yes. Lord willing, you will be deemed when we're accredited again. <laughs> Lord willing, we'll be accredited <laughs> as I'm deemed. <laughs> and they ask, uh, they frame their questions along a certain way. And they ask the phrase, many of us here who work here know it's called outcomes assessment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's a great question. Do are the outcomes? So the the question is all about how do we frame this in uh, quantifiable, observable means, right? So instead of just talking about it vaguely and we got a feeling and so I we know we're in communion because we're feeling all gooey inside. How, how can we demonstrate it empirically, which is what an outcome is, right? Well, when you, well, I mean, you know, the gospel is full of outcomes, right? The, the poor, the outcast, the oppressed are all freed, right? And delivered. And so is that happening? Um, what are our graduates doing compared to previous years? Is, uh, is this process, uh, what are the testimonies that arise spontaneously and um, because we ask you, what are the um, testimonies that you yield? So there are, there are some empirical, demonstrable outcomes that we could identify with and then also the the test 
are you passing your ordination exams? You know? How happy are the ordination boards with our students? Those would be some other outcomes. What's the time? 2.30. That's what I was feeling. The <laughs> consummation of all things. This has been very, very um, delightful to present this to you, and I hope it has been edifying to some extent. I will bid you adieu and blessing. Go in peace and serve the Lord and study hard. <laughs> Great. Thank you.